This is the second part to the history of biology for Biology 101 in Unit 1. And I left off talking about Robert Boyle and his contributions to science, specifically chemistry. Chemistry is an integral part of biology. And uh, we'll devote a little bit more time to chemistry later on in the semester especially in chapter 2, chapter 3, where we talk about uh, biochemistry, we talk about uh, atoms and molecules, which are very important in understanding cellular processes. The next person up was uh, Charles Lyell, and he lived from 1797 to 1875. He is sometimes referred to as the father of geology and helped it to become a science in and of itself. He wrote a book on geology that greatly influenced Charles Darwin, and he believed the Earth was millions of years old instead of thousands of years old. Uh, many people up to this point in time uh, in Western thought, especially those uh, who consider themselves Christians, would describe the Earth as being thousands of years old. If you uh, want to know more about that, you can read after a, a James Usher who lived in the 1600s and uh, published a work. Annals of the World, where he actually dates back through history all the way to the point of creation. So Lyle's work was a, a different direction, very different direction, and other scientists used it in their work, including Charles Darwin. Before we get to Charles Darwin, I don't have his name up here on the list uh, that I'm showing you, but I will put it in for the one that I provide in class. That's Erasmus Darwin. Erasmus Darwin lived from 1731 to 1802. And uh, I mentioned him and his life uh, overlapped uh, Lyle's life. But uh, he was important because he was the father of Charles Darwin. Erasmus Darwin was a physician and he wrote quite a bit about evolution. And Many people think that Charles Darwin plagiarized his grandfather, Erasmus, using his writings and passing them off on his own. Because many of the writings of Charles Darwin find their origin back with Erasmus Darwin. Charles Darwin is the one you see next. He was born in 1809 and died in 1882. And he was greatly influenced by his grandfather's writings. He went to school to become a surgeon studied for a period of time, but the surgeries were too gross for him. He, uh, he was bothered by them and uh, switched. Instead of majoring in medicine, he majored in theology. Many people don't realize that, uh, him being uh, the one that put forth uh, the idea of evolution by natural selection. Uh, don't uh, connect that with theology, and, and actually he, he veered away from theology in his life, but that was his major in college. He is best known for proposing natural selection, whereby uh, higher forms of life evolve from lower forms of life by processes uh, from the environment. He was going to wait until after he died to have his writings published. But he found out there's another guy by the name of Alfred Wallace who had the same ideas and was getting ready to publish his work. So he decided to go ahead and public, have his works published, and they were in the book on the origin of species, that's the short name of it, in 1859. And he just decided that he would uh, go ahead and face whatever controversy and uh, backlash that, that might form for him. As it turned out, it, there were people that disagreed with it, but he didn't face the opposition that he thought he would. Uh, he traveled around on the HMS Beagle for a few years around the Earth, and it was South America that had the greatest effect on his thinking and the ideas that he proposed. And it was the Galapagos Islands, specifically off the west coast of South America, that he focused on, and considering the finches and the tortoises and the differences between those animals amongst the different islands. He took Lyle's book with him, and supposedly also took a Bible, but he didn't read much of his Bible and paid quite a bit of attention to Lyle's work and uh, developed his theories of evolution. 
Some people claim that his health was never the same after his travels around the world. Some said he was a hypochondriac. Some think he may have picked up a, a parasite that uh, goes by the, the disease name is Chagas disease or South American sleeping sickness. It is fairly common in South America and Central America. We don't know for sure, but he stopped on in different parts of South America towards the beginning of his trip and after he came around the tip of South Africa, the ship HMS Beagle sailed across the Atlantic and stopped off in South America again before going back to England. It is noteworthy that Charles Darwin came from a uh, family of good standing. Financially they were well off and so he was considered a gentleman and he had connections so that he was invited to ride along on the HMS Beagle. Part of that came about because the former captain of the HMS Beagle committed suicide and it was thought that the previous captain didn't have somebody to talk to of his social standing and one of the purposes of Charles Darwin sailing on the HMS Darwin was to provide company and to be of a high enough social standing for the captain and to keep him company but Charles Darwin did a lot of studies on on his trip around the world. The next person on the list is Gregor Mendel. And Gregor Mendel was an Austrian monk. He studied the inheritance patterns of pea plants. And this later laid the foundation for genetics. He was born in 1822 and died in 1884. He lived a couple years longer than Gregor, than, uh, excuse me, Charles Darwin. And um, some scientists, some people that are pretty good with statistics, claim that his, his numbers were too good. That uh, if a person were just to, to carry out the experiments, they wouldn't get the ratios that were as good as what his were. We don't know if that's true or not, but uh, he had the backing where he could devote time to the studies of inheritance, and he wrote his observations, and there are laws of heredity that are named after him. And uh, we'll check into those later on this semester. Francesco Reddy is the next one, and he is out of order chronologically. He was born in 1626, died in 1697, so he lived in the 17th century. And the reason I put him here is because he's important in the discussion of the uh, theory of spontaneous generation. He questioned it, and he came up with an experiment where he took meat and uh, took two pieces of meat, put them in two different containers, and covered one of the containers with cheesecloth. And the cheesecloth would allow air to readily pass through it, but it would keep flies from make, uh, reaching the meat. The meat that was exposed to the flies within a day, two days, had maggots on it. The meat that was covered with cheesecloth had fly eggs up around the cheesecloth, but there were no maggots on the meat. So what Francesco Reddy said was the theory of spontaneous generation was incorrect because if it was supported by the experimentation, there should have been maggots on the meat that had the cheesecloth over it, and that was not the case. Well, some said, well, that may not be true with maggots, but still there are other organisms such as snakes and worms and other organisms that they'll just come out of the ground spontaneously, just poof, and they're there. And so he caused some questions, but because of the reputation of Aristotle, the theory of spontaneous generation held for another couple hundred years. The next person up on the list is Louis Pasteur, and he lived in the 1800s. He was born in 1822 and died in 1895. And uh, he was, he's one of the scientific greats of, of all time. Uh, some have said he's, he's the greatest scientist. Uh, most will say he's the greatest microbiologist of all time. One of uh, his greatest works in the late 1850s, about the time that Charles Darwin's publications were being published, his book was being published, he disproved the theory of spontaneous generation pretty much uh, once and for all. And he did it using hay infusion. He took hay and put it in water, and generally the hay would rot and it would smell, 
and there would be yeast and some other microbes that would grow on it, causing it to rot. And what he did, he took the hay infusion, put it in a long-necked flask, and then he used heat and bent the neck of the flask over to look like a swan's neck, so it actually became a swan-necked flask. He heated the contents, he boiled them vigorously. Now, boiling does not kill all microbes, but he was fortunate because it killed the microbes that caused rotting of the hay. So after he boiled the contents vigorously for several minutes, he set the flask off to the side and he watched it for days and weeks and months and years. And they, it actually had more than one. It never rotted. And up until the 1890s, at least one of the swan neck flasks were still on display at the Pasteur Institute of Science in Paris, France. And I believe it was in the 1990s that they decided to put it back out of public viewing to protect it. But uh, more than 100 years later, it still hadn't spoiled. So he, he did a great job of designing an experiment, and he was very important in disproving the theory of spontaneous generation. He is the one that disproved it. And this changed the direction of medicine and the study of microbes thereafter. And uh, some describe this time period as the, the golden age of microbiology. That uh, pretty much brings us to an end of the people involved in the history of science and especially biology. Some of them may not be as obvious as to why they're important, but when you're studying biology, it greatly helps if you have a strong background in other sciences, such as math, chemistry, physics, to help understand what's going on on the cellular level, if you're talking about anatomy, physiology, the physics of motion, the movement of the muscles, the bones, and uh, just a general application of biology. And so if any of you are thinking about majoring in biology, you'd be strongly encouraged to take other science classes to give you a broader background. Hope this has been helpful. If you have any questions, be sure and email me and I will try to answer those.